Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Nico Tripsevich, the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed interviews co hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. In this series, UC Berkeley archaeologists and others who work with archaeological materials discuss their research and answer audience questions. For those of you joining us live today, you can post your questions in the live chat box that you'll find adjacent to the YouTube video. Today, we are delighted to be speaking with Professor Lisa Mahar from the University of Toronto. Lisa joined the anthropology faculty at UC Berkeley in 2012, and she is a curator at the Hearst Museum where she runs the Geoarchaeology and Southwest Asia Prehistory Laboratory. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, so we'd love to hear about your work. Great, so let me just get things started. There we go. Great, well, again, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. I am really excited to talk about some of the things that I've been thinking about in my research over the last, well, several decades now, but very intensively over the last couple of years with two research projects I've been working on. So I've put together um, a very brief PowerPoint presentation that I will go through rather quickly, but I'm happy to answer questions along the way or go, go back to anything that I show over the next few minutes. So what I decided to talk about today is um, a you know, fairly provocative title here, Rethinking Revolutions, how we understand um, prehistoric hunter-gatherers. And in part, this stems from um, teaching that I do here at Berkeley on uh, the prehistory of the old world, as well as my own research. And I'll use my research in Jordan and Cyprus as case studies to explore some of the issues that we have in archeology span um, around questions of becoming human and really thinking about how we treat uh, the archeological record and emphasize in particular some of the firsts in prehistory. And I think I would argue here overemphasize um, the appearance of certain things in our hunter-gatherer past as being revolutionary instead of perhaps evolutionary. Um, and these are really readily apparent when you go back in deep prehistory and talk about early human evolution. So for example, um, looking at the emergence of the genus Homo and thinking about questions about when did we first become bipedal? When do we have big brains? When did we become hunters? Just a few examples. But then what I'm gonna focus on are some of these later firsts, some of these so-called revolutions that in fact happen, um, I am going to argue here, much earlier in our hunter-gatherer ancestry than we've previously understood. And some of these we can think of as um, appearing probably before the emergence of Homo sapiens, um, but things that we often think of as cognitive milestones, like the appearance of the first art, both cave art and portable art, the first seafarers, knowledgeable navigation around the world by sea, the first domesticates, um, bear, uh, or sorry, uh, dogs, beer, bread, um, the first villages, and then later on, what I'm not going to deal with here, uh, the first cities and the first writing, as just some examples. So to come to my own research and where it fits into some of these issues, I'm particularly interested in two broad themes, which of course have a number of sub themes. And I'm gonna to touch on some of these, but not all of these specifically today. I'm particularly interested in understanding how people interact with their environment. So how they use space and how they create space and uh, how they modify and interact with and transform their landscapes around them. And in doing so, how they make them more than just physical spaces in which human social life is um, interact or engaged, but instead how they make them social landscapes, how people make places, um, how they imbue the landscape around them with um, social meaning and how they interact with each other in these spaces through material culture. So the two case studies that I'm going to talk about are both in a kind of broad region called Southwest Asia. And in particular, I'm going to focus on some of my excavations in Jordan, which are located um, in the eastern part of the uh, Jordanian desert here, 
and in the island of Cyprus, particularly along the south coast. To give a little bit of context to the time period that I'm talking about, I'm talking about the 10,000 years or so before the appearance of domesticated plants and animals or what we really think about broadly as the Neolithic revolution. The idea that people domesticated plants and animals lived in settled villages in this kind of revolutionary change in technology, social behavior and economy starting about 10,000 years ago. But what I want this little chart to emphasize is that in fact, when you pick apart all of the different things, um, archeological evidence that we use to talk about the Neolithic revolution, there's no real such moment um, where all of those things appear together. Instead, they all have their own timeline and trajectory and some of them go back quite far in the past. So for example, some of our earliest evidence for a domesticated dog occurs thousands, perhaps even 10 or 20,000 years before people start domesticating other animals like sheep and goat um, and domesticate plants. So in Southwest Asia, we actually talk quite a lot and a lot of research has been invested in this process of becoming Neolithic, of Neolithization, as I've put here. And in fact, archeologists have put together kind of a laundry list of different um, archeological features that we use to define this process, including the building of homes and communities, increasing art and symbolism and long distance interaction networks, along with a whole suite of other features, including the appearance of domesticated plants and animals as staple parts of our diet. So we're talking about the appearance of these villages that you can see here. However, what I hope to talk about is how the more we start excavating these hunter-gatherer sites, the more we understand that it's much, much more complicated than this kind of so-called Neolithic package um, or Neolithic revolution. But instead, all of these different features appear with hunter-gatherers much earlier than we thought and in hunter-gatherer worlds and worldviews. And one of those particular aspects is thinking about placemaking this idea of the creation of storied landscapes so that the world around us becomes um, socially, experientially, and physically constructed by the things that we do to it and the way that we interact with it. So through our daily experience, essentially. And many people have thought about this in many different ways. And the way that we talk about this archeologically is through creating something called a life history of place. So basically understanding how repeated human action can leave physical traces in the landscape and in different parts of the physical environment that then we as archeologists trying to decipher, try to decipher. The first uh, case study that I'll talk about is my research, which I should add as with the second project I will talk about is done collaboratively with many different co-directors and specialists, both in North America and in other places um, in the world. But the first one that I'll talk about is the site of Haranafor in Eastern Jordan, which is a site that was occupied by hunter-gatherers about 20,000 years ago. It is a very large aggregation site. It is the largest hunter-gatherer site that we know of in this part of the world. It's about 21,000 square kilometers or square meters. And what I hope to also show by this inset here is that it is incredibly dense in archeological material. So everything that you see on the surface is an artifact. It's a stone tool or the debris from making stone tools. So made by people. And that extends about two meters down with the site's deposits, which are incredibly well preserved in this dry desert environment. Our two questions for this site really focused on why people settled here and what types of activities that would have created such a large and archeologically dense site. I won't answer the first question here, except to say that we've done a lot of um, environmental research to demonstrate that when people lived here 20,000 years ago, it was at least actually a very lush wetlands. And so that was one of the things that drew people to this site. And so what I wanna focus on instead is what types of things people were doing at this aggregation site. So once they were drawn to this region, what were they doing at the site itself? And our research here has focused on excavating many different parts of the site. It's a multi-component site. So it was occupied in 
um, both early and middle phases of the Epipaleolithic period, basically in essence from about 18 to 20,000 years ago. And during that time, these different hunter-gatherer groups who were coming to the site were staying there for prolonged periods of time. Sometimes they were staying there for multiple seasons throughout, of, throughout the year, perhaps for several years, dispersing again, coming back again. And it's possible that some groups stayed at the site and other groups may have joined them um, at different times of the year or maybe different years in a, in a more kind of dispersed schedule of movement for these hunter-gatherer groups. Some of the very earliest occupations of the site involve constructing huts. Um, and if you think back to the laundry list, I talked a bit about building homes and communities as one of the markers of the Neolithic. Well, this is some of the things that we see at this site, not just one hut structure or two hut structures, but several of these hut structures that show very elaborate patterns in their construction, their maintenance over time and their use. And just to give you an idea of some of the features here, um, you can see some shell beads and red ochre that were involved in um, deposits that actually sealed the end of life of these hut structures. Um, in between these areas, we have hearth features where some of my colleagues here are excavating a hearth that was um, stone lined with a number of tortoise shells and gazelle horn cores that were placed upright around this feature. So very interesting things going on that relate to um, the actual use and function of these structures, but also how people thought of this space as being um, both symbolic and domestic space. And I, again, I'm not going to go through these in extreme detail, but one thing I want to point out or highlight as I go through all of these images is that at all of these hut structures, we have multiple floors that are used again and again and again, and deposits, including caches of material, so stashes of lithics and bone tools and animal parts that are still articulated together are left very intentionally on these floor surfaces before a next floor is laid down and they're used again. And then after the use life of these structures, they're intentionally destroyed, burnt down um, and sealed over. So the end of the life of these structures is also very well marked a symbolic action by the people who lived in these places. And so I've just highlighted some of the things that we find on the floors of these hut structures here. Articulated animal remains, we have tortoise shells, gazelle, um, fox paws, we have bone tools, and we have shell um, beads. And I'll talk about those shell beads in a moment. They come from very far away from the site. And in fact, this is, I know, quite a busy slide, but really what I wanna point out is that we use very high resolution data that we can get at this, this site, including microscopic examination of the archeological sediments that contain the artifacts to tell us about the different activities, the sequence of events, and you can tell very briefly what some of these are by these little stick figures along the side that tell us about what people were doing inside and of course outside of these hut structures. And you can see what some of these caches look like, a cache of stone tools, these gazelle horn cores that were placed around the hearth that I mentioned. And in fact, this is the trace of a, a hunter-gatherer toolkit um, that was contained. So we have a core here for making stone tools, for making small knives, and the paws of a fox that formed the handles of a pelt bag that this toolkit was carried around in and then eventually stashed in. So we can see this kind of rich interaction of both symbolic activities as well as everyday domestic activities that were taking place around these structures that were um, constituting a community of hunter-gatherers living at this site. And we can get a good window into their daily life through these structures. Well, that's really just, interesting. So, thank you. Um, I want to remind our viewers that they can post questions to our uh, live chat stream on YouTube. And uh, can I quickly uh, interrupt with a question, Lisa? Yeah, yeah so I was, it made me wonder to what extent are some of these sort of infrastructure that remain like ground, you know, big pieces of ground stone perhaps. And because you mentioned that these are sealed over, mm. but then presumably there's some features that are kind of reused year after year. Right. 
So we don't have large pieces of ground stone associated with these structures. Um, we do find ground stone at the site, but it tends to be outside. And I think it's exactly for the reason you mentioned, which is that they tend to be reused. They're very large pieces. And so um, you would really have to bury these hut structures to hide them completely. But they also have a very long use life, large ground stone implements. And so they were probably um, kept outside of structures and used again and again and again. It seems that when these hut structures were abandoned um, or destroyed, there was no longer access to any of the material that was inside of them. They were left basically undisturbed um, until, of course, we disturbed them during excavation. Uh, and I think that's actually a really important feature of how the site has built up over time. Some parts of it were used very intensively again and again and again when people revisited the site, but some parts were actually very uh, consciously left alone. Mm -hmm. And part of that actually, this is a nice segue into what I wanted to talk about with the second structure that you see here. Part mm -hmm. of the reason is that these houses also appear to have served as um, burial grounds. And so we have several human remains at the site which are associated with these huts structures. And so I've highlighted one of them here with this orange box. We had the, the remains of an adult uh, female, an adult woman in her probably um, 50s or so, so kind of midlife, which was probably not midlife during this time period, but a little bit um, into, into so-called old age, um, but we would call midlife today, where this may have been her hut structure, um, she was clearly placed on the floor of the structure, the last floor of the structure, um, immediately before it was then burned down. And so she was burned inside of the structure. Uh, we've done quite a lot of forensic work on the degree of burning, the type of burning um, that suggests she was probably wrapped in a hide, something that wouldn't have uh, caused, for example, com complete cremation. And a, a little bit of sand was placed on her on the skeleton. So as part of the process of burying the hut, um, she was covered over slightly. The superstructure, the uh, wood and probably reed and grass superstructure of the hut was burned down with her inside. They were both covered over and sealed and left that way basically for the last 20,000 years. While other parts mm -hmm. of the sites remained very heavily used um, mm -hmm. in, in later periods when hunter gatherers visited the site. And so, in fact, the later occupations, which are represented here, what we call the middle epipaleolithic occupations, also had very structured use of space, but in a slightly different way. It seemed to be much more communal and in a slightly different part of the site, which is part of the reason why it's also such a large site, is people didn't live in exactly the same place every time they revisited it, but lived in slightly different areas, in part because some of these areas may have been, um, you know, taboo, so to speak, for, for subsequent occupation. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from the, from the web for okay. you. Um, someone says, the fox pelt bag is amazing. Are there other examples like this, other species? And could the tortoise shell have held things? Right, actually, that is a great question. Um, fox and tortoise and gazelle are really, really commonly found, not just at this site, but at other sites from th throughout Southwest Asia that date to the same time period. Mm -hmm. So people were both really heavily relying on these animals, probably as foodstuffs, but also as um, for other purposes, like using their pelts for clothing, perhaps as part of the shelters, um, as burial shrouds, um, and as, as bags, as ways to, mm -hmm. to contain things. And tortoise shell may have been exactly the same. And in fact, that may explain why those three species are found so commonly inside of these hut structures um, and less so, or I shouldn't say less so, they're very common outside as well. But outside, we have a wider range of animals that were exploited. Mm -hmm. But gazelle in particular, these guys really liked a lot. They were naturally abundant in this kind of grassland and wetland landscape but they also very intensively exploited them. And some researchers working elsewhere have suggested that these epipaleolithic groups may have really over-exploited gazelle during this time period. Mm 
Um, and that may have been one of many different kind of pushes towards domesticating animals is, you know, to, if you want to maintain a, a steady food supply, then you take an increasingly active role in managing and maintaining um, the food that you're particularly interested in. Gazelle, mm. of course, were never domesticated, but other similar animals were. Mm. So, and in fact, I've made the case elsewhere um, in other research that I've done that fox may have been one of those animals that people tried to domesticate. Um, it has many similar features to the dog, but it's much more timid. And you know, to date, we haven't domesticated them, but there are examples of tame foxes. And so it's That's possible right. people experimented with lots of different animals uh -huh. as hunter-gatherers before yeah. some were settled on as, you know, what we know as domesticates today. That's right. You've surely followed that Soviet fox domestication yes, study. Yes, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Yeah. So we're getting a few more questions here. Um, sure. Someone asks, uh, can you talk about the work shell and notched scapula and rib? Mm. So did I talk about, perhaps I showed a slide. The work shell, not sketch, scapula and rib. Um, I, I'm not sure specifically what they mean by the notched scapula and rib, um, but what, what I can talk about is the shell, in fact. Um, There's that lower yeah. left. Oh, yeah, so in fact, yeah. oh yes, down there, uh, the ribs, yes, sorry, the worked bone. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there is two pieces of worked bone in that lower um, image. One is a gazelle mandible that has a series of notches that are kind of placed along this part of the mandible. And the other is a wild cattle, an auric rib that has a pattern of incisions along it that are grouped in um, incisions that are six in number and then a space in four in number and six in number and four in number. And in fact, we find that pattern repeated multiple times at the site. Um, as well as patterns of three and four. I would love to be able to tell you I know exactly what they mean. Unfortunately, I don't. One of the most yeah. difficult things, of course, is getting into the minds of 20,000 year old hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. um, but they're clearly significant to these people in marking something because we find them repeatedly on different bones um, and in different parts of the site. Mm -hmm. And so they're not strictly uh, associated with one particular instance of hunter-gatherers using the site or one particular context. Um, people have found these things at other contemporary sites and have made many different suggestions about what they might mean. They might mean ways of mapping out the landscape. They might mean ways of counting time, marking time, counting the number of hunts, maybe successful hunts and not successful hunts. We don't know exactly. There's lots of different possibilities. Um, it could have been it, a game. A eye that you noticed that actually, or it could be games, exactly. Yeah, or gambling or something. Like that's that. right. <laughs> They're also um, using marine shell very intensively at this site, which uh -huh. is very, very interesting, very cool, because there's no marine, there's no source of marine shell anywhere nearby. So you uh -huh. have to travel several hundred kilometers to either the Red Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. Um, or we actually have some species at the site which are today found only in the Indian Ocean. It's possible they may have existed in other closer by bodies of mm -hmm. water like the Red Sea or Mediterranean 20,000 years ago, but nobody's found any evidence of that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So people are, in any case, going really long distances to get the shell and bring it back to the site. Or one thing we've argued for quite a bit if we think of this site as an aggregation site where people are coming from other places and congregating here, of course, they're bringing things with them. And one of the things that they may have been bringing with them, if they are hunter gatherers that lived closer to the Red Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, is these marine shells. And we have tens of thousands of marine shells at the site, um, more than most other contemporary sites put together. And so there's clearly a very strong connection between the people who are congregating at this site and other groups who are closer to the access points, the Mediterranean and Red Sea, where you would get this shell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we see that not just in the shell, this kind of network of trade and exchange, but we see it in the stone tools as well. So mm -hmm. here, interestingly, we've done a lot of uh, studying of the raw material that the stone tools are made from at Harana. They're all from the surrounding area, maybe 20 mm -hmm. kilometers away at most. Mm 
but the different types of tools that they make, the different forms are um, mapped out in a very different way. And so, in fact, we use the different forms of these microliths to talk about change in group identity over time and across space. But what we find at Harana is a blending of all of these different types, which if you think about it, is not unexpected if we're concerned with or thinking about people coming from this large region and congregating at the site. They're bringing with them the knowledge and the preference for making specific shapes of stone tools mm. of these small little microlith pieces that you see highlighted here, but they're making them on site. And so perhaps they're flint napping and making these tools with other groups, other hunter-gatherer flint nappers who are used to making other things and you know, sharing and exchanging these traditions and this knowledge. And so you get kind of a blending of this, um, these flint napping traditions at the site of Karana which again kind of lends further evidence to these hunter-gatherers who are at the site itself actually being engaged in a much wider hunter-gatherer world with groups who are both near and far, where they're exchanging ideas, information, as well as material culture. Mm -hmm. And so this comes back to the idea of placemaking. So not only is Harana itself, uh, I think, a fairly important place in the landscape, but of course it's just one of many different places that are marked out in some of the ways that I've highlighted on this slide here, through burials, through symbolic objects, through caching, through construction, um, and through their interactions with different plants and animals, including fox. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, another question here. It was about one of the artifacts you showed earlier. Um, I don't know if you wanna maybe conclude this part and go back and Sure. Well, in fact, I, I probably just did that. I don't need to say all the things that are on this screen. People can, can take a look at it for themselves. But essentially the idea that, you know, a lot of the things that we once thought belonged to the Neolithic, symbolic art, um, building houses and communities, and long distance trade and exchange are three that I highlighted earlier. But we can see those very clearly at sites like Harana 4. And I should add that it is not the only site this early that shows evidence of this in this part of the world. And in fact, it shows that this site actually sits into a very, very complicated hunter-gatherer world where these hunter-gatherers were doing already of a lot of the things, both cognitively, um, but also in terms of economy, technology, and social interactions that we thought really kind of were pegged to these later Neolithic farmers. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah, so somebody asked about one of um, one of the artifacts in the earlier slide, I think maybe the one with the rib, with the notched okay. rib. Sure, would you like um, me to go back to it? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, they said, what are the markings on the artifact in the upper left-hand corner? So I imagine yeah. that's in this. That slide. is a piece of limestone, which is just from the local landscape um, that has been uh, carved or incised, um, so it's a small plaquette essentially. It's partially broken, as you can see, this edge is broken and this edge is broken, both broken in mm -hmm. prehistory. This was also broken in prehistory, but we managed to find these two pieces at least that fit together. Oh, fantastic. It has a, a groove along this edge and it's kind of beveled here. And then on this surface, it has these two, um, hopefully you can see them, these uh, kind of ladder-like designs. So here there are two, oh vertical lines and then horizontal ladder runs, so to speak. And then here's one very deep vertical line, a series of horizontal lines coming off, um, alternating on both sides, but also much lighter are these other vertical lines here that you can see, which in fact kind of bound either side of this large ladder-like design. Exactly, again, what the significance is that is really, pretty open. We have no idea specifically what it was intended to depict, except to say that this ladder design, these geometric designs are very common at these epipaleolithic sites. So it's not the only site with these plaquettes. And in fact, there was a site nearby that was recently excavated, which had animal figurines carved into these stones. So 
if I talk very briefly about the second case study I wanted to talk about, it's in fact just extending all of these very same ideas to Cyprus, an island, um, and adding some new uh, information about the movement of people from one place to another, particularly the interactions between people in the mainland and the island of Cyprus during the Epipaleolithic period. And in fact, we now know from recent evidence that we have, we see seafaring technology appearing long before we have Homo sapiens and probably extending back um, quite frequently with Neanderthals and some people have suggested even earlier. But of course our evidence is much better with the Epipaleolithic period, particularly evidence in Cyprus. And if I go back to this chart that I talked about earlier, about defining different moments, one thing that is notably missing is seafaring. And so that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit today. Some of our kind of imaginative aspects of um, epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers navigating from the mainland to Cyprus and back again over time. Um, Lisa, I'm sorry, I, I cut out there. My, my internet connection dropped, okay. but, but um, we're actually, running into the 1230 here. Okay. And I'm wondering if maybe we can invite you back for sure. Yeah, for yeah. The second I half. I believe stop there. If it's possible to sort of maybe conclude and yeah. And, uh, well yeah. in fact I will just go right here then. So you can get a small preview of this. And leave it at saying okay. One of the key things that we're particularly interested in in Cyprus, which again, I'm happy to come back and talk about, is how we can extend our idea of this hunter-gatherer landscape to include seafaring technologies. What happens when people move to new places and interact with new environments and each other now over kind of these vast spaces um, uh -huh. where we find some of our earliest evidence for the occupation of the island of Cyprus during, during this time period. Wonderful. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, and I'll have to save one. This has triggered many great questions. And <laughs> um, one of the questions I had, we'll save for next time, but I'll mention is about cordage. And I was thinking that one of the, you know, you mentioned all those technologies that are associated with later periods, but who knows how early that, I mean, I guess some people know how early yes, that is. I would happily talk about that. We've done a lot of phytolith work that uh -huh. suggests good evidence for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, let me conclude by um, thanking you know, Lisa Mahar, our professor of anthropology, and thank, thank you listeners and viewers who sent in questions. Um, I wanna invite everyone to join us tomorrow at noon for a presentation by Professor Christine Hastorf. Um, she's gonna be speaking about Spanish conquest in South America and the impacts on the chili pepper. So, um, so please join us then and uh, note that we have a feedback form that's linked in our description below. So we invite you to provide feedback on our series, uh, Ask an Archaeologist and today's talk. So thanks again, Lisa. My pleasure.